Well, right now I want to introduce to you uh, Rick Green. Uh, again, we're going to be starting a, a biblical citizenship class. Again, we have one going on right now, but we're almost done with it uh, on Monday nights. But in the fall, we're going to start another one. So Rick will be out at the information table to sign you up for the biblical citizenship class that we will be having right here. It's an eight-week course. You do not want to miss it. It's absolutely amazing. It'll change the, your perspective and the way you see uh, not only God, but also how your responsibility and, and role as a, a biblical citizenship uh, citizen. So now I'm going to introduce you to Rick. I don't know where he is. Oh, there he is. Uh, founder of Patriot Ac Academy and also the biblical citizenship. And uh, Rick, take it over. Good stuff. Come on, make some good stuff. He's got some awesome kids. He's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. I love this church. I love this family. Y'all are so blessed. To have a pastor willing to speak truth boldly, a church willing to be salt and light. Uh, there are more and more waking up across the country, but I'm just telling you, you guys are an example uh, to many others, and so you're incredibly blessed. And he's an incredibly brave man to let a, uh, a Texas politician have his pulpit. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm, I'm planning to go about four hours. You guys okay with that this afternoon? I'm, I'm, we're going to have lunch brought in. No, actually, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm a recovering politician, which means I go to a Tuesday night meeting every week. You know, I'm saying I'm Rick, recovering politician. I think I'm four years clean off the ballot, so that's pretty good. I should be getting some sort of little, you know, button or pen or something at, the, at this point. But uh, no, listen, we don't want more politicians. We want more patriots. Amen. The difference is, the difference is a politician is only thinking about the next election. A patriot is thinking about the next generation. So that mindset is very, very different. And every single one of us need to think like that. We need to be thinking, what can I do to pass the torch effectively to the next generation? So I'm, I am uh, also a very proud Texan. So you'll just have to forgive me for that this morning. I'm one of those obnoxious Texans. I know to you non-Texans, you think all Texans are obnoxious, but... You, you got to understand, and maybe this will help you understand and have some, you know, just pray for us and have some grace. Um, when you're raised in the great state of Texas, you're usually 15 before you, you find out. There are some other states out there, okay? That's just, we're just kind of like that. We tend to think there are only two kinds of people, Texans, and those that want to be Texans. That's it. Two groups. So that's, uh, that's just our mindset. Please forgive us of that. I'll uh, hopefully be forgiven of my, my Texas pride today. But my, my um, uh, I actually think God takes care of that. You know, he always, he always finds a way to to humble us when we need it. I don't know if you've ever had pride issues, but you know, when I got elected to the legislature, I really thought I was somebody, but I was, I was actually deep down really insecure. I was 27 years old. I wanted everybody to think I was important. And so I was actually sitting in my office in the big city of Dripping Springs, Texas, which I'm sure everybody here has heard of and, or been there. Right? Nobody? Okay. Anyway, I'm setting things up in, in, in my little town of Dripping Springs and I'm, and I'm wanting to, you know, get it all looking nice. And I hear some guy coming in, and I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm not the one supposed to be setting all this up. I'm supposed to be busy and important. So I, I jumped in my chair real quick. I grabbed the phone before he could make his way back to my office. I said, no, no, I can't. can't see you Thursday. I'm booked. No, I'm booked next Thursday as well. But two weeks from Thursday, I'll see you right here in my office. Put the phone down. He's already made it. He's standing right there waiting for me to get off the phone. I said, yes, sir. Can I help you? He said, no, I'm, I'm just here to hook up that there phone for you, son. Um, <laughs> For you young people back then, they had a cable that came from the wall to the phone, and you had to actually. Anyway, um, so God will humble you. I promise you, He'll find a way to uh, to do that. Uh, I will. I will admit, though, there's one area of my pride I'm not getting rid of. I am still proud to be an American. I think we live in the greatest nation in the history of the world, and I I don't worship that flag. I don't worship the nation. But I am thankful for that flag, and I am thankful for this nation because of the freedom in this nation. I'm able to live out my faith. America continues to be 80% of the missions around the world. We continue to be the greatest blessing and the most benevolent nation in the history of the world. Other people benefit because of the biblical foundations of our nation. And so today, I don't want to do a, you know, an apologetics apology for America or defense of America. We could do that. When you take the course, we go through the whole thing, and we say, listen, we're good, the bad, and the ugly. America, believe it or not, was founded by humans. So the, the founding fathers of America who did some amazing things sinned. They also did some evil things, just like you, just like me. They were sinners just like us. So we don't deify those guys. We don't deify the American story. Uh, we recognize that God used flawed men and women to put in place the greatest principles the world has ever known for a nation to be founded upon. They were biblical principles. They found their way into our Declaration of Independence, into our Constitution, 
into our laws, and as a nation, we became a more perfect union over, over time and eventually applied those principles to all Americans? Did we get it right in the beginning? No, absolutely not. I mean, I'm sure you heard there was an Ivy League educated United States senator that stood on the floor of the United States Senate and announced to everyone that America invented slavery. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, you might have found this guy named Joseph. You remember him? Sold by his brothers into, I'm not perfect on the timeline, but I think that was before 1776. Yeah, just a few months before 1776, exa exactly right. So, of course, the narrative's ridiculous. In 1776, every nation on the planet had slavery. You had white on black slavery. You had black on black slavery. You had black on white slavery. You had red on black slavery and red on white slavery and white on red slavery and some yellow in there and some bronze and a few other colors in between. Slavery was the condition of mankind. Every single nation had it. What nobody's teaching these days, except maybe biblical citizenship and Patriot Academy, is that America was the first nation on the planet to ban the slave trade. We beat England by three weeks, baby. We were the fourth nation on the planet to end slavery in our nation completely after a war and 600,000 casualties. There's still 90 nations on the planet today that have not banned slavery. There's more slaves on the planet today than there were in 1776. So we've got this warped narrative that, that, that makes it look like if you don't have the right color of skin, you don't have ownership in the American dream. What a lie. We're lying to the children of America. We're actually teaching our kids to hate their own nation. I don't know of another nation in history that did that. So now they're hating themselves, they're hating each other, they're hating the nation. It's poison. It's the poison of cultural Marxism. We should be teaching them the stories of great black patriots in the founding era that helped to found this nation. That say, that, that may, the American Revolution, as we teach in the class, began with a black patriot, Crispus Attucks, in 1770, and ended with a black patriot by the name of James Armistead, who set up as a double agent, set up Yorktown for us. What would happen if you told those stories? A little black boy or girl would, would learn the evils of slavery and the evils that happened in our founding era, but they would also learn the good stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And every little boy and girl in America should learn those stories. Every girl in America ought to know the story of Sybil Ludington. 16-year-old midnight rider that mustered 500 men there in Connecticut for her father, who was the colonel. You know, we had a, in one of our TV shows, Chasing American Legends, we had a competition between my kids. My, my daughter was convinced Sybil Ludington was the better midnight rider. My son was convinced Paul Revere was the better midnight rider. So we went to Carmel, New York, where, where uh, Sybil Ludington ended up living out the rest of her life and went to Boston and traced the footsteps of Paul Revere. And they did this whole story about, we did a whole story about both of them, come to find out. Sybil Ludington, 16 years old, rode three times as far as Paul Revere at night in a massive storm, fought off muggers, mustered 500 men, and unlike Paul Revere, who rode on a beautiful Boston night through city streets, did not get caught. So I'll let you figure out who the better midnight rider was. But every girl in America ought to know that story, right? Anyway, we should be telling those stories. We ought to tell the whole story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We don't run from the ugly. We teach it so we can learn from it, right? That's why you still have, you know, statues and things to Absalom. Worst, kid, worst son in, in the history of mankind, right? But you want to learn from the evil as much as the good. You want to learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's what we do in biblical citizenship, and I encourage you to take that class so you can get that biblical worldview of what a society ought to look like, but also understand here in America what it ought to look like under the Constitution. Well, if you open your Bibles with me this morning, we're going to start in Psalm 78. And it's, and it's really a, a, a great message, a great scripture for where we are as a nation. We're failing to pass the torch of freedom, to hand off the baton to the next generation and teach a providential view of history. But we're not the first ones. You know, every time you think, man, America's messing this up, we got to be the only people in history to do what we're doing. No, just read the Old Testament. You'll see the children of Israel going up and down, up and down. They have blessings or curses right before them, as Deuteronomy says. Sometimes they choose the blessings, sometimes they choose the curses, just like... America. So we can learn from their mistakes. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a, morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truth. Stories we heard from our fathers. Counsel we learned at our mother's knees. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvelous things he has done. He planted a witness in Jacob, said his word firmly in Israel, then commanded our parents to teach it to their children. So the next generation would know. And all the generations to come, just think about that in terms of our children's children's children will know of the mighty things God did. 
Know the truth and tell the story so their children can trust in God. Never forget the works of God, but keep his commands to the letter. Heaven forbid that they should be like their parents, bullheaded and bad, a fickle and faithless bunch who never stayed true to God. The Ephraimites, armed to the teeth, ran off when the battle began. Think about that. They had what they needed to win, but yet because of fear, they ran off from the battle. They were cowards to God's covenant, refused to walk by his word. They forgot what, we, what he had done, marvels he had done right before their eyes. He performed miracles in plain sight of their parents in Egypt, out on the fields of Zoan. He split the sea and they walked right through it. He piled the waters to the right and the left. He led them by day with a cloud, led them all the night by, with a fiery torch. He split rocks in the wilderness, gave them all they could drink from underground springs. He made creeks flow out from sheer rock and water pour out like a river. And all they did was sin even more, rebel in the desert against the high God. So you walk through all of that and you go, wow, okay, so if we pass the torch effectively, if we actually teach God's role and his miracles and, the, and that providential view of history, then the kids get it and they can then come to know God and they can then live according to God's word. But if we drop the baton, if we don't teach the next generation, if we don't instill these things, then they're going to rebel. So we've got to pass it along to the next generation. We've got to teach them God's fame and fortune so that they will know these truths and that they'll have to make sure that they're teaching them. We've basically been given in America this wonderful gift of freedom. We've been given the gift of a nation that was absolutely absorbed, that was absolutely saturated with God's word and benefited from that. And for the last 60 or 70 years, we stopped teaching it to the next generation. We stopped reminding ourselves and our children and our grandchildren God's providential view. And so we fumbled the ball. We basically buried the talent. So if you think about the parable of the talents in Matthew, and you think about the, the three servants, they were given the talents. The master went away, said, work these, do the best you can with these, multiply these. We as a nation have been given the talent of freedom. We've been given the talent of a great economy, a great system, wonderful political and economic structures. And we've been given the choice to either be one of the servants that works that talent, multiplies that talent, um, becomes a force multiplier, teaches it to our kids and grandkids, or we can be the wicked and slothful servant that buried the talent, that either out of fear or of laziness chose not to work the talent. I've heard, I heard one story uh, from a pastor, basically the perspective was, it wasn't just that they were afraid of the master you know, being, you know, punishing them if they lost the talent. They were literally afraid of the master doing what they knew the master would do, which is exactly what the master did with the other two, give them more work. And they didn't want more work. They were truly slothful. I thought that was a very interesting perspective. And I think that may be even the more accurate description of us as the church today or as citizens today is that we just don't want to do it. We don't want to be more involved. We don't want more responsibility. When in fact, we should be saying, I'm going to be faithful to a little so the Lord will give me more and so I can work even harder. Six days shalt thou labor. We bought into this ridiculously lazy new version of the American dream. I don't even want to work 40 hours. Now they're saying 40 hours is too much for us to work. Well, the Bible says six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. So we're supposed to be willing to work. And, put, and there's no retirement in the Bible, by the way. Can I just, this is a total rabbit trail. I'm gonna go down here. But if you're 65 or you're 70 or you're 75, you might be in a different area of the culture. God might be giving you a different work, but you're not done, guess what? Until you're six feet under. Till you take the big dirt nap, you're not done. God's got something for you right now to be, you might be going fully intercessor. Right? You might spend your days praying for things all around this country, around, around the world, or maybe you're going to go into to some form of ministry, or maybe maybe be a biblical citizenship constitution coach. And whatever it is that God's calling you to, you're not done to your six feet under. So we've got this talent, this wonderful talent of freedom. What are we doing with it? I would argue we have been sitting on it, doing nothing. <laughs> we've been the wicked and slothful servant as a whole, as a nation, as, a, as the church in America. And as a result, the culture is crumbling all around us. If we can just be honest, the American culture is crumbling right before our eyes. The nation's falling apart. Now, we can look at that and go, oh, my goodness, we're done. Grab your guns and canned food, go hide out at the ranch. A lot of my friends, that's, they've decided to do that. Now, I think you ought to have the guns, I think you ought to have the canned food, and I think you ought to have the ranch. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 12 says, a wise person foresees danger and takes precaution. A simpleton or a fool walks blindly on and suffers the consequences. I think you need to be prepared. We'll be canning food all afternoon right out here in the... No, I'm kidding. Um, 
But, but but you seriously, you, you ought to be prepared for what could, I mean, if we have an economic, you know, craziness for six months or whatever, you need to be prepared for that. Right? If the culture does continue to fall apart, you need to be prepared for that. But this is not a time to run for the hills and say, I'm not going to do my job as a citizen. I'm not going to use the talent that God gave me. Now's the time to say, yeah, the culture's crumbling around us, just like it did in the Old Testament multiple times. What did they do? They looked at the rubble and they said, let's rebuild. Let's pick up the pieces. Let's rebuild. Right now, you have a wonderful opportunity to do that. Right here in this community, right here with this church or at your home church if you're visiting this morning, you have an opportunity to pick up the pieces and say, what are the pieces of the formula that will produce a good result? How do I rebuild society? How do I rebuild liberty in America? How do I influence what's going on in a positive way? I don't want to be the wicked and slothful servant, so how do I become the good and faithful servant? What do I do with this talent of freedom to help save liberty for my kids and grandkids? So we're going to learn a little wisdom from the founding fathers. Noah Webster was the great educator in early American history. He's actually the guy that suggested the copyright and uh, patents clause in in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. He understood the importance of of being able to protect those things. And Noah Webster, who trained millions and millions of Americans, tens of millions of of Americans over the decades, ended up um, um, learning how to read, how to spell, all those things from Webster's influence, from his uh, Blue Black Speller, which you can get at Wall Builders, and all kinds of cool stuff. But here's what his observance was. By the way, brilliant guy. I think he learned like 14 languages to do his first dictionary. Just incredible guy. Um, But here's what he told us about how to pick up the pieces and how to make sure that you don't have a crumbling culture. He basically said... And right before this quote, I forgot to put this in the, in the slide that I'm going to show you, but he, he actually said that our Constitution and our laws should be based on the morals and the values and the principles of the Bible. And then he said, all the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. So he's basically saying, if you are getting in the culture right now, bad stuff. If the output side of the equation is garbage... It's because you're putting in garbage. It's on the input side of the equation that you're not putting in the good stuff, and so you're getting the bad stuff as a result. And I used to look at that quote for years, and I'd say, yeah, that's right, man. Those those, those secularists, those those, those anti-biblical people, they're despising the precepts contained in the Bible. That's the reason for every one of our problems in America. And I do think it contributes to the problems, but it would have been nothing. It would have been a blip. It would have been just a little bump if it hadn't been for... The, dis, the neglecting of the precepts contained in the Bible, because guess who can neglect the precepts contained in the Bible? The, all of us that know the Bible, right? All of us that know. Wait a minute, that's the answer book. That's the instruction manual for life. But we're neglecting it. If we're not in it every day, we're not learning truth. We're not learning the, the design that the manufacturer of your brain and your body and your relationships, the, the creator of the universe gave us an instruction manual saying, here's how you'll get the most out of life. And so if we're neglecting that, that's when the lies will seep in. That's when others and cultural Marxism and all the things that have been poured into our culture will have such a bad impact. So I think he was 100% right. I think, yes, those that despise the Bible will have a negative impact on the culture. But we're the ones, if we neglect it, we're going to get all of this bad stuff up here. And so it's our job to get back in God's Word. And I'll I'll tell you, we could talk, you know, political strategies all day long. We could talk about the importance of of electing good people. I'll, I'll probably mention a little bit of that today. In fact, Webster will have a few things to say about that. That's all important, but none of that's going to make a difference if we don't do the most important thing we can do. And the number one thing you can do, and everybody in this room, may, hopefully you're already doing it. If not, you can start today. The number one that thing you, you can do if you want to preserve and save liberty for your children and grandchildren, if you want to pass the torch of freedom effectively, number one thing for every one of us, be saturated in God's word absolutely saturated in it so that you know truth and then you'll recognize the lie and you say no that's a lie that doesn't add up I know from God's word that's not something I want to follow that's not a politician I want to support that's not a policy I want to do that's not something I want to teach my kids you'll recognize the lie if you are in the truth but we got to be saturated in God's word nine percent of Americans read God's word every day I'm sorry nine percent of Christians read God's word every day nine percent of Christians so 91 percent of us that say I'm following God, I'm following Christ, he's my savior, I'm submitting to his authority, are not reading the answer book or the instruction manual on how to actually live that thing out. Now, listen, I'm not, I I fail just like you. We all fail, right? And so sometimes I go, you know, a week and haven't been in God's word and I'm like, man, why am I so frustrated? Why am I so angry? Why are things falling apart? Why am I so tempted? Why am I, all that, man, I haven't been in the answer book. 
I've been neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. And I got to catch up. So I'm just, I'm just encouraging you. Get into God's word. Read it every day. Read through the Bible every year. You will be amazed. If you do what the founders did, which most all of them did that. That was their, their practice. They knew they needed to do that. So every day they had a, a daily reading in the Bible. And every year they got through the entire Bible. If you'll do that, I can absolutely 100% guarantee you that several days a week, at least once a week, you're going to be reading, doing your daily reading. You're going to go, that was not in there last year. Somebody snuck that into my Bible. I've, been, I've read the Bible I don't know how many times. I've never noticed that. I've, I've never even heard of that guy. And how in the world do you pronounce that name? I mean, you're going to do that. I promise. It's going to happen. And then it's going to be the one thing you really needed that week. You won't even know it yet. But then the next day, something's going to happen. You go, oh, man, I'm so glad that was in there. I'm, I'm just telling you. Trust me on this. Get into God's word, not only for you personally, but for us as a nation. We have got to get back to the precepts contained in the Bible. The founders were big on this, man. John Adams was adamant about it. They all, uh, so many of the founders, in fact, Adams talked a lot about how our constitution is only made for a moral and religious people. If you don't have a uh, virtue in the culture, it's not gonna work, it'll all fall apart. But he said about the Bible, he said, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book. And every member, every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? He's basically saying, listen, if you follow the precepts of the Bible, if everybody were to do that, Man, think about how much less crime you would have. Think about how many fewer police officers you'd have to have. How fewer laws you would have to have on the books where government is trying to come in and keep us from killing each other because there's no virtue. You're not going to, the less virtue and morals you have, the less liberty you're going to have. Just basic common sense. If you think about it. If you don't have virtue and morality in the culture, we don't make it to the car without being raped, murdered, or stolen from. And so then government has to grow create more and more laws to keep us from killing each other, and therefore our liberty gets more and more constrained. Whereas if, if we can self-regulate by reading God's word, by following God's word, the more we do that, the less we need government to regulate us, which was the whole design of the American system. The more we can self-govern, the less big government that we need. And that's essentially what John Adams is saying there. Andrew Jackson said the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. Adams also said the general principles upon which the founders achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. So we're, we're founded on these principles of Christianity. Benjamin Rush, who signed the declaration and was a very, in fact, he was considered by the other founders when they would talk about who the most important founding fathers uh, that created the nation were. Benjamin Rush was, was often listed in the top three or four guys but we don't know much about him uh, today. Uh, David Barton has a great book on him. If you get a chance, check that out at wallbuilders.com. But I'll give you just one long quote from him on Christianity, on the law, on the culture, why the Bible's so important. He said, Christianity is the only true and perfect religion. In proportion as mankind adopts its precepts and obeys its precepts, they will be wise and happy. The gospel of Jesus Christ pres prescribes the wisest rules for just conduct in every situation of life. Happy they are who are enabled to obey them in all situations. The Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in his present state than any other book in the world. He's based, you know, and he, he, he actually talks about, I think there was one more. Let me see if I skipped it. No, I don't have it in there. He, he goes on to talk about, it's like a map of the human heart is I think part of the quote that I think fits so well. Because think about it. It is, it's, it's, if, if, if you think about your instruction manual for your, for your vehicle, uh, for your, for your, you know, microwave these days. I mean, every, all these uh, devices that are so complicated, right? They have an instruction manual that is written by the designer and the designer knows how every circuit, everything works, and is telling you, if you want to get the most out of this creation, listen to the creator about how it works. And so he has this long quote about how the Bible is the instruction manual from the creator of how your body and your brain and your relationships work. And if you follow the instructions, you get the most out of life. You, you're the most productive. You have the best relationships. You have the most joy. All of those things. So the Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in its present state than any other book in the world. By renouncing the Bible, philosophers swing from their moorings upon all moral subjects. So in other words, it's, the, it's, it's like a, um, a foundation that when you get away from it, now you have, no, uh, you, you have no connection to reality. Philosophers swing from their moorings upon all moral subjects. Now philosophers can't even tell you what a woman is. They have denounced even basic biological science. The CDC just released instructions for how a man can chest feed. I've been calling them the Center for Demented Confusion for years. They're now making it easy to call them that, right? I mean, it's 
absolutely absurd. We have lost our ever-loving minds because we're unmoored. We've let go of the foundation, and so now we don't have reality as a culture. The Bible's the only correct map of the human heart. That's the one I was looking for that ever has been published. On education, he talks about the Bible. The only means of establishing and perpetuating our Republican forms of government. Notice he didn't say our democracy. Because we're not a democracy. When they always say, that Rick Green, man, he's a, he's a threat to democracy. You're darn right I am. You ought to be a threat to democracy as well. The founding fathers called democracy one of the greatest of evils. They called it mobocracy. They said it will always end in violence. You don't want democracy, folks. You want a republic. You want a constitutional republic. You want a republic and representatives that are limited by what's actually written on paper. We don't just elect people and say, go do the best you can. We say, we elect people and say, go do the best you can within these boundaries that we've given you within our constitutional limitations. The only means of, perpetuating, uh, of establishing and perpetuating our Republican forms of government is the universal education of our youth and the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. He's basically saying, again, liberty won't work if you don't have virtue, if you don't have morals. And so as a republic, which is you know, built on, on liberty, you've got to educate people on the Bible so that they can self-govern. It's essential to who we are. The Bible should be read in our schools in preference to all other books because it contains the greatest portion of that kind of knowledge which is calculated to produce private and public happiness. The great enemy of the salvation of man never invented a more effective means of removing Christianity from the world than by persuading mankind it was improper to read the Bible at school. The Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. The whole point, we need the Bible as the foundation if we want a free society. If you want all that stuff in the culture where you want you know, prosperity and liberty and freedom of religion and freedom of speech and freedom of the press and all those things you read in the Constitution, you want all those things, then you've got to have the Bible as the foundation. It's not enough to just put them in a document. John Hancock, one of the financiers of the Revolution and, and uh, the president of the Continental Congress when they gave us the Declaration, uh, very involved, very much an instigator along with Sam Adams uh, from the very beginning. He said it this way whenever he was uh, governor of Massachusetts, he did one of the many prayer proclamations. Uh, founding fathers were really big on calling the community to prayer. They did that in the Continental Congress. They did that as presidents. They did that as governors. And it wasn't just prayer. It was prayer, fasting, humiliation. They got serious about it. Hancock said, sensible of the importance of Christian piety and virtue to the order and happiness of a state. In other words, not just for you personally. You're not just going to have a, a, a life that reflects the benefits of a, of a biblical value system. The culture will the virtue to the order and happiness of a state. In other words, your neighborhood's going to do better. Your city is going to do better. You're going to have less crime. You're going to, all those things will be better if most of the citizens are living according to this. I cannot but earnestly commend to you every measure for your support and encouragement. This is in his, one of his prayer proclamations. Pray that the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be established in peace and righteousness among all the nations of the earth. Pray that all nations may bow to the scepter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that the whole earth may be filled with his glory. Pray and confess our sins before God and implore his forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, just a typical atheist proclamation. <laughs> Another one of these, you know, agnostics, deist. I mean, these, these guys, if we had all day, I could give you quotes from virtually all of them. 95% of the founding fathers, outspoken Christians. They lived it, they talked it, they wrote it, they spoke it. There's just no denying it. There's about 10 guys. Out of all 250 of the guys, these were the guys that signed the deck, the Constitution, the major generals, the governors, all the key players, in the, 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 the main leaders, there's about 10 of them that were not Christians. They, they did not believe Jesus to be the Son of God. There were none of them, though, that were atheists. There were none of them that were agnostics or deists. They believed in God. They believed in the hand of providence. Uh, ben Franklin's whole speech at the Constitutional Convention that saved the day. Five weeks in, people were leaving, going home, saying, it's not going to work, it's falling apart. The least religious founding father got up and basically pounded the other guys over the head, quoted 11 different Bible verses, telling them, we cannot forget the Father of lights. He illuminates our understandings. He, he, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground as a note, without his notice, it probably an empire can rise with it, uh, without his aid. He goes on and on and on about the hand of providence involved in our daily lives. That is not a deist. That is not an agnostic. That is not an atheist. In his case, that's someone that believed in God, believed he was involved, did not believe Jesus was the Son of God. As some people say late in life, maybe he didn't. Basically, I put him in the category of not a Christian. He's one of the 10. Out of 250, that 5%. We ought to be judging our founding fathers on 95%, not even that, that handful. Anyway, bottom line is they absolutely believe that we should be calling upon 
Christ to be involved in our culture and making sure that we're following the Bible. In fact, even in our laws, you know, some people say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't base your, your laws on the Bible. You have, to, you have to just come up with that stuff yourself. No, you don't. This guy gave us the Constitution and the Declaration. James Wilson, he also signed, I mean, not only did he sign both those documents, one of only six to sign both documents, he was on the original Supreme Court. That's a Supreme Court justice, United States Supreme Court justice, one of the first six. So he's one of the guys that George Washington puts on the court to basically, you know, begin this thing. And here's what he said about the Bible and the law. He said, human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the law, on the authority of that law which is divine. In other words, city council ordinances, uh, school board rules, um, state legislative laws that you put on your state laws, your congressional laws, federal laws, all of those human laws, criminal, civil, all of it should be based on the Bible. That's what he's saying. The biblical principles, that's why the Ten Commandments used to be, that's why we see it on all the courts, that's why you see it in the Supreme Court, because the Ten Commandments was the foundation of all of our other laws. In fact, he goes on to say, far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters. They're friends, they're mutual assistants, and these two sciences run into each other. Not meaning they run into each other like conflict, meaning they work side by side. They're pulling like a couple of oxen to give us a good culture, a good society. And when, when you reject the Bible, when you reject religion, and you're only doing the law of the tiger and the shark, whatever the majority wants, whoever's the strongest at the moment, whoever can think up the most. If you're only doing that unmoored from the truth of God's word, the society is going to fall apart. It's absolutely going to lead to tyranny. The founders talked about the hand of God in everything that we did. John Adams, it appears to me the eternal son of God is operating powerfully against the British government. James Madison, about the Constitution itself, said it's impossible for the pious man not to recognize in it a finger of the Almighty God, which was so frequently extended to us in the critical stages of the Revolution. With regard to the ratification of the Constitution, George Washington said it demonstrates as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. There was a guy out of Houston, Don Lutz, and a group at, at the university there that took 15,000 of the Founding Fathers' writings and said, we're going to figure out what was going on in these guys' heads. What were they thinking when they put in place this incredible constitutional republic, this system of government uh, that, that produced such an incredible result. And so they took 15,000 of their writings. Who were they quoting? And they said, okay, well, yeah, they were quoting Montesquieu the most, 8.3% of the time. They were quoting Blackstone almost as much. Uh, and Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws was a huge influence. Blackstone's commentaries uh, on, on the law, 7.9%. John Locke, of course, huge influence specifically on the Declaration. Jefferson uh, wrote the Declaration. And Richard Henry Lee, who made the motion for independence at the Continental Congress. He said that Jefferson just copied the Declaration almost exactly out of Locke's two treatises of government. And in Locke's two treatises of government, my little version of it, it's a 1764 version, it's 406 or 7 pages. And in those 400 or so pages, there's 1,500 Bible verses. So wait a minute, the, the guy John Locke that's writing the two treatises of government upon, on which Jefferson is basing the Declaration is using 1,500 Bible verses to tell us what government should look like, but they're all atheists. None of them wanted religion in any of this stuff. Now, okay, well, who else were they quoting? 34% of the time they were quoting the Bible. The Bible was the foundation of the American founding. It was the foundation of what we celebrated this week, 247 years in our nation. It is the foundation of our Constitution itself. Phrase after phrase, clause after clause, principle after principle, right back to Scripture, according to the Founding Fathers. The whole idea of separating powers, yes, Montesquieu talks about that in the Spirit of the Laws, but John Adams said it was Jeremiah 17, 9 that drove that idea of the heart is evil, no man can know it. So if we, if we make George Washington president, and, and we give him, or we make him king, and we give him all the power, even as the father of the country, the indispensable man, he has evil in his heart too. There's not a person in this, in this room that we could make king and give you all the power that eventually that evil's not going to come out. And so we want to spread this power out as much as possible. We want to, at the federal level, have a, have a judiciary, have an executive, have a legislative. They're not three equal branches, by the way. Take the class. You'll figure out. You'll, you'll learn that's not, not true, even though they teach that. Uh, but we also have a vertical separation of powers. So you got federal, state, local, count, you know, uh, um, um, fe yeah, federal, state, county, local, all of that. We're spreading this thing out as much as we possibly can, and we give jurisdictions to each of those so that nobody gets all the power. That was the whole idea out of Jeremiah 17, 9. Republicanism, our, our whole way of of doing that at the, uh, at the, at the federal, state, uh, um, county, and local government. That's basically uh, Exodus 18. Choose out from among you leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. And then even how we choose those leaders. Able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. There's a guidebook right there for how we choose 
those leaders. So it's all, it all goes back to the Bible. They, they, they traced it over and over and over again. And they even started Bible societies. These guys, they started, let's see, Benjamin Rush started the Philadelphia Bible Society. You got all these other guys that started local Bible societies. You look at the list of the founders of the American Bible Society, and it's all founding fathers. It's all people that were involved in giving us the deck or the Constitution or early governors. James McHenry was one of the guys that gave us the Constitution. He started the Maryland Bible Society. He said, Bibles are strong protections. When they abound, men cannot pursue wicked courses and at the same time enjoy quiet conscience. He's basically saying if the Bible's everywhere, if it's infused in our entertainment and our, and our laws and in our, 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 our pulpits, obviously, but also our education system, if the Bible's everywhere, it's a lot harder to pursue wickedness with quiet conscience. In other words, if you're doing wrong and you're doing evil, then you see all over the place why it's wrong, why it's evil, and what the bad effects of that will be, even for you. So we would do less evil if everywhere around the culture it's telling us, hey, don't do that, that's bad for you, that's bad for your family, that's bad for your kids. But what did we do? We rejected God's word, we pushed it aside, and now what do we do to wickedness? When people want to do wicked, what do we say? Oh, you just do you. You just do whatever feels good. And so now we have people marching in the streets naked, shaking all their stuff in front of seven-year-olds. And we're celebrating it. We're encouraging it. We're saying, well, that's just them. We have people right now in America trying to make it legal for adults to have sex with children and say that's just fine. And, and there are people that are actually struggling with, well, I don't know if I can tell them that's wrong. So what we started with decades ago, we just, want to, we just want people to be able to love who they love. What we started with, and when we said 30 years ago, if you do that, if you get outside of the biblical definition of marriage, if you get outside of the biblical design for sex, it will lead to all of these horrible things. We were laughed at. We were mocked. We were told we were bigots and everything else. And now here we are, 30 years later, they're trying to legalize pedophilia. Bestiality will be next, and somebody's going to say, oh, Rick, it'll never come to that. You, you look at this insanity right now. We have kids in schools that are claiming to be cats. The furries, they call themselves. And instead of not being able to do that in quiet conscience, instead of the school, that the parents are not going to do it, instead of the school saying, you are not going to do that in school, you're not going to meow at your teacher. Instead of doing that, you know what we're doing? We're putting kitty litter in the bathrooms of the schools so that these kids can have quiet conscience in this insanity that they have been lured into and led into. That's what happens when you remove any concept. We are unmoored from any concept of right or wrong. Does that make sense? I mean, it's really practical. It's logical when you think about it. The problem is we have a delusion that has entered into the American mindset. Now, you really want to go down a rabbit hole here. I'm sitting on the plane with John Rich. This is a country music legend. And he's saying to me, he's the son of a preacher, literally, he's got a song called that, but he's actually a son of a pastor named Merlo, Texas. And, and, and he's saying to me, he's like, Rick, you know, you realize, and Thessalonians, and also, I can't remember where it is in the Old Testament, he's like, he says, you realize the delusion is sent by God. It's like, what? I thought we were just being stupid. No, when you reject truth, God sends a delusion. It's judgment, folks. It's judgment. The delusion is happening, not only in, the, in America, but in the church in many places. So I, I, don't, I can't tell you, I don't have an answer to when the delusion is lifted. I, don't have, I, I know we need to be praying for mercy, but we have to embrace his word in order to know truth so we aren't deluded, so that we don't fall for the lie. So I didn't mean to say all, you know, give, give you all that to depress you. I'm just saying you got to wake up and realize what's happening right now. There is no, you know... That was an underwhelming response, but yes, yeah, I mean, there, there, there is, there, because the Bible doesn't abound, we have people living in insanity, and they have quite, they're just happy about it, because nobody's actually teaching and speaking truth. Doesn't mean we have to be hateful about it. We can be loving about it, but we got to be firm. we got to speak truth. We don't have to be jerks when we do it, but we do have to be strong. Now, that doesn't mean we say, I'm so afraid of offending anybody. What would Jesus do? He'd turn over some dead gum tables. That's what Jesus would do. He'd say, this has got to stop. He would say, you white sepulchers. He would say, this is evil. This is wrong. 
Why are we so afraid to do that? What would Jesus do? Everybody thinks he was sitting around petting lambs? He was a lion, baby. I mean, he was often very sarcastic. <laughs> and, 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 and people got offended every time he spoke. Christians that are afraid of offending, they have no idea who their Lord is. I'm telling you right now, Patrick Henry had a great line at the beginning of the, of the Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech he gave on my birthday, March 23rd. He knew that was going to happen years later, so he did it on March 23rd. Um, so he gives this great, that might be fake news, okay, of everything I've said. But, but he had this great line at the opening of that speech. He said, according to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. Only in this way can we arrive at the truth. And should I hold back my opinions out of fear of giving offense, then I would offend the great creator of the universe. In other words, he's saying, I don't care if I offend you. Guess what? If I step on your toes this morning, let me just apologize. My intent is to stomp on them. The gospel's offensive. The gospel convicts. That's the whole concept. If you don't have truth, the truth is offensive. And then you go, wow, I'm convicted. I'm intrigued. I'm a, and then you look and you sharpen and you, that's the way it's supposed to work. Why do you think COVID got so out of hand? Why do you think the insanity of what government did over the last three years happened? Because no debate was allowed. We weren't able to arrive at the truth. Now, those of us that were debating it, pastors that were like Garrett, willing to stand up and question and speak and all that, we found truth. We found the science. We followed the actual science, not the guy that thinks he's science, Pope Frouchy. That's a Freudian, not a Freudian slip. It's not a purposeful slip. Fra fraud. He's a fraud. He ought to be in jail right now. He did more damage to the American people than anybody in history. But we weren't allowed to debate and have truth. Don't be afraid of offense. Speak truth and let the chips fall where they may. That's what, that's what happens when Bibles abound. It's good for everybody, he goes on to say. Public utility pleads most forcibly for the general distribution of the Holy Scriptures. Without the Bible, in vain do we increase penal laws and draw entrenchments around our institutions. We can pass all the laws in the world that say, you be good, but it won't do any good. We have to have the Bible permeating the culture. That's what I'm trying to get across this morning. George Washington said that the distinguished character of a patriot should be, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of a Christian. You want to be a true patriot? You want to help save this country? Saturate in God's word and tend the garden the way that he told us to in the Bible. See, we're following the Bible. We're taking good care of our neighbors. Even the atheist that hates religion would acknowledge that treating others the way you want to be treated would make for a good society. I mean, Thomas Paine hated organized religion, but he recognized that if you follow these things, you get a better culture. Benjamin Franklin, now again, as I mentioned, not a Christian, but he recognized Christians make the best citizens. So it just makes sense, even for the people that don't share our views. And that's why I think, you know, if anybody's going to write me and say, well, Rick, you sound like a, a Christian nationalist. You know, there's another way of saying that. It's called being an American patriot. It's called caring about your country, having a foundation of things you actually believe in. I mean, I don't even know what people mean by that. Christian nationalists or dominionists, they make up these words. And why do they do it? To scare you out of the public square. That's why they do it. They try to make you think, well, if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to be involved. A good and holy Christian stays over here and doesn't get involved in business or politics. That's nasty stuff over there. Well, my Bible says, Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, I'm just a country boy. You know what that means? It's all his. Every single bit. Why do we not see God in, in, in more of these areas of the culture? Because we're not taking his principles there. We're not being salt and light. When we are salt and light, all of those areas flourish from God's principles. And the Buddhist benefits, the, the Muslim benefits, the secular, everybody benefits. The entire culture benefits when Christians are involved and they take their values and the Bible into the culture. doesn't mean you have to be a Christian to live in America. Nobody I know wants a theocracy. I'm not suggesting that at all. And nobody in the movement. I'm pretty involved. I don't know anyone. I have never met anyone involved in the, in the, in the movement to save America and save liberty that wants a theocracy. That's not at all what we're suggesting here. We're suggesting that people of faith have just as much voice as anybody else in America. And if they let their voice be heard, then those values of treat your neighbor as you want to be treated, all the other things that, uh, of, of, from Christian principles that make a good society will dominate in the culture. But here's where we are. Romans 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's where we are. We knew God as a nation. There's no doubt about it. The history's all there. If you, if you just go read the writings of the Founding Fathers and what happened. As a nation, we knew God. Really, up until about 60 years ago, we still acknowledged God as a nation. 
I mean, Kennedy and others talk, in, in their speeches talked about God and acknowledging God, and it was, it was just part of who we were as a nation. But now we started rejecting God. We started pushing God out of the equation. Well, Romans 1 told us what happens when you do that. We change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, change the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more than the creator. The whole environmental movement is about worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Now, I believe we're supposed to, as Christians, take good care of what we've been given, be good stewards of, of our money, of our property, of the, of the planet, all of those things. But you have to be a, a, a scientifically based, economically rational environmentalist. Not an environmentalist that worships the creation rather than, than the creator. That's the way we should be. We should do it the way that God said to do it, not the way that the world wants to do it. Uh, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in, in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I know everybody's getting nervous. Oh, he's preaching against homosexuality. What are we going to do? No, I'm, I'm talking about sin. All of it. Heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, all the different sexual sins, but not just sexual sins. Look at all the stuff that Paul lists right here. If you don't see yourself in here, you're lying. We all need a savior, okay? Every single one of us, right? We're all depraved. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignancy, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient. Anybody found themselves yet? Okay, I'll keep going then. All right. Without understanding, covenant breakers. See, without understanding. If you hadn't found yourself, you're without understanding. Covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, here's where we are as America, but have pleasure in them that do them. We have churches right now that are actually celebrating anti-biblical sex and anti-biblical philosophy and anti-biblical, all kinds of stuff. We have churches that are saying, I know the Bible says not to do that, but you just be you. Instead of saying, we love you despite what you've done, just like we are loved by Christ despite what we've done and do, and we want you to change. We want you to take the word of God and let it change you so that you can actually live in joy. Instead, we're saying, oh, gee, everybody's, everybody worships with us no matter what they're doing, whether they turn from their sin or not. That is a formula for disaster, folks. It actually absolutely zaps the power of the gospel. And instead, it encourages and it literally takes pleasure in those that are living outside of God's word. So they knew God. They stopped acknowledging God. They didn't glorify God. They didn't retain God in their knowledge. Exactly what we did as a nation. Exactly what we've done as individuals, right? We've rejected God's word. We started with the courts in, 60, we, uh, in 1962. This was the, uh, the uh, Warren Court. We said no more uh, praying in schools. Somehow that would be dangerous for the kids. You know, No more praying in schools. No more Bible in schools. That was the Abington v. Shep, Murray v. Collette. Then we said no more uh, praying at football games. No more uh, t you know, uh, under God in the, in the, in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance would be unconstitutional. Arrested pastors for praying on the sidewalk. Uh, required pastors to turn over their text if they were in any way speaking about biblical sexuality. We actually said the Ten Commandments would, would be bad. The Supreme Court of the United States said, well, if you put the Ten Commandments on a wall in a school, they said the, the kids might see them. If the, if the, if the kids see them, they might, they might read them. And if they read them, they might study them. And if they study them, they might, they might obey them. And that would violate the Establishment Clause. Really? So if the kids see and are told that murder is bad and they decide not to murder, that's bad? If they decide not to steal, if they decide to actually honor their mother and, and father, I mean, really? I mean, let's just stop and think for a minute. So what do we do as a culture? We said, hey, no right and wrong. No, 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 we don't have any Ten Commandments. Get that out of the school. There's no right and wrong. I mean, as a teacher, I couldn't possibly take a position on morality. And so everybody do whatever's right in your own eyes. Just do whatever feels good. There is no God, there is no right or wrong, there's no consequences, so you just go with your feelings, you, you be you. And then we're shocked that a student can walk into a classroom, take out a gun, and murder classmates. We put a formula in place that says, do whatever feels good. There is no right or wrong, there are no consequences for you. And then we get Paducah, Pearl, Jonesboro, Littleton, Santa Fe, you just go right down the list. 
of all these mass murder events, they are not mass shootings. I'm so tired of that language. A mass shooting is what happens when Mike Holler and I go to the range. There's a lot of shooting taking place, right, Mike? So, so, so th there's nothing wrong with shooting. There is a whole lot wrong with murder, right? And so these mass murder events taking place, I mean, it happens every three or four months in America. It's not even news unless at least, you know, five or six or ten people get killed. You know, it, it wasn't news last week when I think seven or eight were killed because the murderer was a, you know, a, a transgender BLM activist. So nobody in the media wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about the hormone therapy, the psychotropic drugs. In every single one of those cases, you're going to find one of those two things. So anyway, we have all of this insanity happening, and we gave the formula. We, we, we literally created blessings or curses in Deuteronomy. We chose curses. Everybody wants to blame the gun. Well, I could take out my 1911 .45 caliber right here, and I could set it down on the stage. We could all line up around it, hold hands, and chant, it will not jump up and shoot anybody. <laughs> it's just going to sit right there and do nothing unless a human being picks it up and points it at someone and presses the trigger because it's an inanimate object. What's the real problem? The heart of man. It's the depravity of man. Nothing's changed, folks. The laws of nature and nature's God haven't changed. Nothing new under the sun. Thomas Jefferson said it 200 years ago. He said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if we remove their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they're not to be violated but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. You take God out of the equation and you tell everybody to do whatever feels good, you get chaos. You put God back in the equation, you teach people right from wrong, and, and you can do it in, in a very intellectual, logical way. It doesn't have to be an emotional thing. You can show people statistically why God's way is not just right, it's better. In fact, we teach at Patriot Academy at all our legislative simulations, you, you never get on the floor of the House or, or, or the Senate and argue for a bill, you know, beating people over the head with a Bible. You don't have to quote a single scripture to make arguments and, and, and logical reasons why you don't want gambling in every backyard or why you don't, I mean, pick any moral issue, why you think, you know, that, 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 that child marriage should be outlawed in our country. Why you think, I mean, all of those arguments, you can do it with data. You can do every gun argument with data. You can, all of it can be done with data. Why should self-defense be something that the citizens have a right to? Not only just because it's in the Constitution, why, do you, why can we defend that? Why can we show logically why that's the case? We got to get better at that. We got to be able to argue. My, my, my friend David Barton, one of my mentors, has a great talk on this called Thinking Biblically, Speaking Secularly. How do you think with biblical principles but couch the arguments so that you can win people over in your neighborhood and in your, in your community? The founders were great at that. And that's why it's our job to be salt and light. I, I'm just telling you the church is absolutely essential to liberty. If we are salt and light, as I said, everybody flourishes, everybody benefits as a result of that. When the salt is put into the meat, it preserves the meat. When it's left out, the meat spoils. We're the salt. The meat in America is spoiling. The culture is crumbling all around us because we've left the salt in the shaker. If we put the salt into the meat, not only does it preserve it, it brings out the best flavor, everybody benefits. So our job as the church is to be salt and light so that we can once again be that city on a hill. Now this one's going to really bother some of you that might have visited for the first time this morning. But Charles Finney said it this way, and, and this is not John Travolta in Staying Alive. I know it's confusing, it's very similar, but... You now know what Staying Alive was based on and where John Travolta got his moves. From a preacher in the second great awakening. Okay, that's fake news too. Anyway, um, Charles Finney said it this way. He said, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Whoa, church taking ground in politics? What does that even mean? He explained. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean Church of England is now in charge of the government. Doesn't mean that the head of the church is now president and now we're going to make uh, you know, a theocracy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying... Politics is part of a religion in a country such as this. Break that down. Politics is just part of your religion when you live in a constitutional republic where you are in charge of the government, where citizenship means taking good care of that talent that you've been given, multiplying it and working it. In other words, just like your, your religion, uh, your faith influences how you treat your spouse, how you treat your kids, how you treat your business, how you spend your money, your religion is influencing all of that, right? Well, it should also influence how you vote. 
how you serve if you're, if you're leading in your community, how you treat your neighbors, all of those things. So he's just saying it's no different than anything else in our life. You, you, you've never walked away from, from this church saying, you know, oh, wow, Garrett preached, man, that was on fire this morning. That was such a good sermon. I wish I could use it at home and treat my wife the way he said I should, but there's a separation of home and church. <laughs> Nobody in this room thought that, right? That never even crossed your mind. You've never left the church going, man, Garrett preached such a good sermon about good, you know, work ethic and treating your employer well and honoring them and honoring your employees if you're the employer, but I, I can't use it at work tomorrow on Monday because, you know, there's a separation of work and church. Nobody in this room has ever bought, thought that. Why do we separate politics from our faith? We, because we've defined politics as this partisan, maybe. I don't know what, what's going on in our minds, but we've defined it as this special box over here that is completely separate from everything else. That is not true. And so that's all Finney's saying. He's saying, listen, Christians, do your duty to your country. Live out your citizenship. Be a good Caesar because you are Caesar under our system. We the people, right? So be a good Caesar. Be a good citizen. As Christians, do your duty to your country as part of your duty to God. So you're literally just living out your life in every area and letting the Bible guide you on all of those things and leaving nothing off limits. And then everybody benefits or everybody's cursed. God will bless or curse the nation according to the course Christians take in politics. That just simply means, man, if our principles are winning the day, everybody benefits. If our principles are losing, everybody hurts. It's just, that's just the, the simple way that it works. So there's no secular spiritual split. Every one of us ought to be involved. I'll leave you with two quick stories. I, um, I think you're probably, you know, you, you're, you're, uh, you, you kind of have to fit in one of two categories. There's really no in-between. You're either hearing this this morning and you're going, yeah, man, we need more of that. Absolutely. More biblical instruction. Bible should apply to everything. I want to live this out. I'm going to get involved. Or you might be sitting there thinking, nah, you know what? We're just supposed to preach the gospel. We're just supposed to save souls. And we're not supposed to get involved in all that stuff. Um, there were a couple of pastors in the founding era that had that same debate. These guys were brothers. Their last name was Muhlenberg. John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. He was a Virginia pastor. Frederick Augustus was a New York pastor. And, and, and John Peter was actually in the legislature. So he was actually doing church, and he was also serving in the state. So he pastored two churches in Woodstock, Virginia, served in the legislature. And, and, and he was in, actually, at the legislature and when, uh, when, when the British uh, took all the munitions and, and Patrick Henry rounded up all the farmers, and they're all going after him. So it's all, all this stuff is already kicking into gear. He, he rides all night to get back home to be able to preach on Sunday morning, and all this stuff is fresh on his mind. So he decides to preach out of Ecclesiastes. And he preaches about a season for everything. And, you know, time to plant, time to harvest, all that good stuff. And he gets to a time of peace, and there's a time of war. And he looks out at the congregation. He says, we are no longer in a time of peace. It is now a time of war. And he takes off his robes, his clerical robes, and he's in the full uniform of an officer in the Revolutionary Army. That was one of his churches. He's got his uniform on, and he says to them, uh, play the drums outside. They start beating the drums outside. He says to the men in his church, join me. We must go fight. Out of his two churches, about 300 guys join up, becomes the 8th Virginia Regiment. He goes on to become one of only 13 guys to be a major general. He's actually in the painting of the surrender at Yorktown. Uh, that painting is hanging in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And uh, anyway, so he goes on with a, to, to do some amazing things. But his brother, Frederick Augustus, that I mentioned up in New York, he says the same thing some of you are thinking right now or some of your friends are going to say to you when you talk about this crazy guy that came in from Texas and told us we should, uh, uh, Christians should take right ground in regard to politics. Frederick Augustus writes to him and he says, you should have stayed out of this. You would have acted for the best if you had kept out of this business from the beginning. Now I'll give you uh, my thoughts in brief. I think you were wrong. And basically makes the same arguments. You should just be saving souls and not being, doing all that other stuff. John Peter writes back and he says to him, I am a clergyman. It's true. But I am a member of society as well as the poorest layman. And my liberty is as dear to me as to any man. Shall I then sit still? Heaven forbid it. I am convinced it's my duty so to do, and duty I owe to God and country. And so Frederick Augustus writes him back, and he says, well, you know, part of the problem is just you Virginians. You guys are all a bunch of rabble-rousers, you know, you know, always wanting to get into trouble. You got those Patrick Henry folks, and, and uh, just kind of blames it on Virginia. He says, we don't have this problem up in New York. About two months later, three months later, the British come into his town in New York, kick him out of his church, desecrate his church. He says, hmm, maybe baby brother was right about this thing. And so Frederick Augustus totally changes his mindset. He gets so involved that if you actually take out a copy of the Bill of Rights, you're going to see two signatures on it. You're going to see John Adams, because he was president of the Senate, vice president at the time the Bill of Rights was um, 
uh, proposed by Congress. And then you're going to see Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, the very first Speaker of the House under our Constitution. So a pastor that said we shouldn't be doing this, just but two, and in fact, uh, John Peter was also in Congress. So two pastors that were brothers gave us the First Amendment. Now, they didn't give you the freedom of religion. They gave us the First Amendment that protects your freedom of religion that God gave you. So don't ever look at the Bill of Rights and say, these are freedoms the founders gave us. Those are freedoms God gave you, the founders said that, and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights specifically is about government protecting those rights. They didn't give you those rights, but protecting those rights. But they were pastors that got that involved. Now, why would they do that? They no longer bought into the idea, and this is, this is what's happened in the American church today, that the gospel or the Great Commission is only to get people to walk the aisle and sign the card. It's not. It's to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, which means we have a job to do. It's not enough to share with someone the, the, the amazing part of the gospel that their sins can be forgiven, that they are a child of God. All of that's great. That's the most important part, but it doesn't stop there. We have to then teach them, as Jesus said, to obey everything that he commanded, which means making disciples. And that includes how we vote, how we treat our neighbors, all that kind of stuff. We've left that out for too long. It's time to get back to that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to give of your life, your fortune, and your sacred honor. I'm going to ask you to do like the founding fathers and start living out your citizenship as unto God, not unto men, but in a way that will keep freedom alive for your children and your grandchildren. So in some ways it's selfish. I'm not asking you to do it for your, yourself. I'm asking you to do it for your grandchildren, but it's also going to benefit the rest of the culture. And very specifically, I'm asking you to give of your time. That's your life. Attend the biblical citizenship class here and then do one in your home or at your church and get people thinking biblically, but also understanding our Constitution and how to live out that biblical mindset with our, un, under our particular Constitution. Uh, every single citizen is supposed to study the Constitution, according to the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Get you a Founder's Bible so you can read through the Bible every year and also read the history. So what I love about the Founder's Bible is as you're reading a scripture, then there'll be an, an article inserted about how somebody in history applied that scripture to culture and got incredible results. So it might be about you know, George Washington reading a particular scripture and apply it. It might be about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and what he did in the Civil Rights Movement and how he and A.D. King managed to stay peaceful even though everything was so violent around him. Whatever the article, it's all through there, all kinds of people throughout history. Uh, trust me on this. It's amazing. I read through the Founders Bible every year. I've even got a reading guide that's free. It's on our website. And it'll get, say every day, here's the pages that you read. And you'll get through this part of this chapter, I mean of this book, and you'll read these articles that are inserted there as well. And that way, by the end of the year, you're done. Really, really powerful stuff. I promise it will equip you. And then make sure you're voting. Don't be like some of my friends, I'm not voting. I will not vote for the lesser of two evils. That sounds great, but unless Jesus Christ is on the ballot, you are going to vote for the lesser of two evils. There is none righteous, no, not one. We're all flawed jars of clay. So Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, even a Constitution Party candidate is not perfect. Okay? There's not a single candidate I agree with 100% of the time. There's not one you're going to agree with 100% of the time. You do the best you can with what you got, where you are, and then you work hard to have better candidates next time. But you do not cancel your voice. You do not leave your vote at home. That is the wicked and slothful servant that buries the talent. And now, now I'm going to step on some toes. Let me stomp on them, but let me, let me just tell you. If you are throwing your vote away by either not voting or voting for someone that has 0% chance of winning, okay, you are not being a good steward of the talent that God's given you. I, I can promise you there are often candidates that are actually more aligned with my viewpoints but have zero chance of winning. They're literally polling at 0.01% or maybe 2%, right? And then there are candidates that are with me on about 20% of the issues, there are candidates that are with me on 0% of the issues. We call them Democrats, typically. Um, and then there are candidates that are with me 80% of the time or 70% of the time. That I'm, gonna, I'm not going to help the Marxist because I throw my vote away. Does that make sense? Are you offended now? If I didn't offend you yet, I'll, I'll keep going. I, I'll, I, my goal is to offend everybody in here before this is over. So please, just be wise. Pray for discernment. Get together in the church and, and with other people and, and study the candidates and figure out what's the best thing to do here. Who, what's the strategic? It's a talent. Multiply it. Uh, be, be wise about how you use it. Okay, and then uh, let's see what else I got up here. 
Uh, oh, let me just give you no Webster's quote and then I'll close. I'm sorry, Garrett, I'm going long, I know. And I'm standing between you and lunch, so I gotta shut up. All right, no Webster said, when you become entitled to exercise the right of voting for public officers, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for your rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. The preservation of our government depends on the faithful discharge of this duty. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. Laws will be made not for the public good, so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute the laws. They'll take $5 million bribes from, from uh, Ukraine. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men who will smoke crack cocaine in the White House. Which, if you're still wondering whose cocaine it was they found in the White House, um, we're never going to know. The Secret Service announced that it is impossible to figure out whose cocaine baggie had the uh, H. Dot, um, Biden on, 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 the, on the outside. So they, they said there's no way to figure it out. Um, I'll let y'all think about that one for a minute. And the rights of the citizens will be violated or disregarded. If our government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men to make and administer the laws. Folks, that's where we are. Uh, we're letting that happen. And, and I mean, now that I'm pretty blunt, let me just be blunt. If, if, if you refuse to vote for one guy or gal because they have mean tweets or because they say something you don't like or they have some, some immorality in their, in their life, but the other candidate is actually passing laws to allow you to kill babies up until the day of birth and sometimes after, and actually parading around a grown man who thinks he's a little girl and celebrating that and encouraging the culture to adopt that and saying to you at your local school district, no matter where in America you are, you will let grown men into sports for girls and let them go take showers with your daughters or we'll take away your federal money. That's happening right now. That's the occupant of the White House. In other words, what I'm saying is there's no perfect candidate. I am not telling you to go vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Ron DeSantis or whoever. You can figure it out. You can, you can either vote Republican or you can vote Marxist. That's up to you. But I am telling you to study the candidates and then make a decision which one is the least bad because there is not gonna be a holy one, I can promise you. There, there, there's just not, it's not gonna happen. So don't be a fool. I mean that with the biblical, I mentioned in Proverbs 27, 12 already, didn't I? Or was that the last service? It all runs together and you, when you're doing the second service. Anyway, don't be the fool that doesn't make wise decisions and take precautions. Sometimes you're gonna to have to vote for somebody that offends you, but ends up giving us three Supreme Court justices that overturn Roe v. Wade, right? And I, I say that as someone who disliked the man vehemently in 2016. I was a Ted Cruz guy all the way. I couldn't, I was, it took me a while, trust me. But you know what? God used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. He used, he's using this flawed, jars of clay, flawed jar of clay, right? Anyway, I'm just saying, I don't know who's going to be the nominees in 2024. It, it may or may not be any of the people that I've mentioned so far. A lot can happen in a year. All right. <laughs> Do I? Then no, it's not going to be me for sure. But yeah. so, so I don't know who it's going to be. I'm just encouraging you to get together, pray, make wise decisions. But the last thing you can do, I am, I'm absolutely demanding that you do not stay home. You do not bury that talent. You use the talent that God gave you. Okay. Uh, I do want to tell you real quick, make sure you're sending your kids to Patriot Academy where they can get good biblical worldview, good life leadership skills, all that good stuff. We do youth leadership programs all over the country. We do one here in Colorado at your state capitol and at Colorado Christian. Uh, we already did it last month, so it's too late for this year, but you can send kids next year or you can send them to um, our one-year program, which will start next fall, and they can actually stay with us on campus for a year and, and get some really, really good stuff. So anyway, check all that out at patriotacademy.com. We have a military veterans Patriot Academy as well where they come in and spend a week with us and really get Get fired up about their next mission to save America from within. So that's the two things I'm asking you to do. Just live it out, man. It's not that complicated. Live your freedom. Don't bury it. Don't take it for granted. Our, our veterans, when we do our graduation at Patriot Academy, they stand there and they pass the torch to the kids. The kids come forward, they sign the declaration, and the veteran says to them ceremonially, I was willing to die for your freedom, 
Now it's time for you to go live it. All right? That's, the, that's exactly what every one of us needs to hear. We need to live this freedom out. Don't, don't think I'm saying it's all political. Benjamin Rush said to John Adams at the, at the, uh, at the, at the very end, or when they were about to vote for, for independence, he said, you think we'll win? Can we defeat Great Britain? We're taking on the greatest military power on the planet. Can we do this? John Adams did not respond with a military strategy or a dissertation on freedom and rights. He said, yes, if we fear God and repent of our sins. So, so if we're going to be a nation under God again, we've got to be individuals under God. It begins with us, right? Let's get our hearts right. Let's turn from our wicked ways. Let's ask God for forgiveness. Let's get saturated in God's word. Let's start building community around those things, and let's go tend the garden that God has given us. God bless you, and thanks. Garrett. I want, to, uh, I want to pray for Rick, if you guys would stand and join with me before Josh leads us in worship. So if you guys would pray, let's ask God to bless this nation again. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just come before you the only way that we can through your son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for salvation. We're grateful for this nation that you founded under God, under you by godly men who feared you and repented of their sins. So we, Lord, we repent of our slothfulness and our apathy as a church. We ask that you would pour your spirit out on this nation again and give us a second chance. You would bring revival like the first and second great awakening in the Jesus movement back across our nation. Lord, we plead with you, give us a second chance. God, we repent of the 70 million babies' blood that cries out from the ground. The blood of righteous Abel cried out from the ground. We repent of, of, of playing church and not being the church. Of not being bold, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, would you give us strength and courage? And I want to pray for Rick, Lord, as he continues to fight the good fight, Lord, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. You would give him wisdom, discernment, understanding, and knowledge, and then instruction on how to apply those four things in his life and ministry. Bless Patriot Academy. Bless the biblical citizenship class. God, we want you to be glorified. So Lord, we stand up here as two sinners, Lord. Would you forgive us of our sins, Lord? Cleanse us even of those things we don't know about that are deep in our hearts. And renew, your, renew our minds by your Holy Spirit and, and the Word of God, Lord, because it's the Word of God that changes things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.